and that, that and that was what was so damaging about the anti-nuclear that that campaign was was got them into the environmental movement. They, they turned up agitating against the bomb, and then they suddenly found that they could use this to penetrate the environmental conservation movement. The conservation movement before that was quite sensible, just doing all the normal things you do if you care about the environment. Hello, welcome to the Macquarie University Liberal Club Sunday Sessions podcast. Coming to you live from the Facebook page, my name is Andrew Kremen, and I'm joined with Lachlan Burke. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. It's good to be with you. Labor's bill seeking a greenhouse emissions reduction of 43% by 2030 has passed the lower house. What might be sacrificed in the process? Might it be energy stability or even, or even food security? Today, we're asking the question of whether environmentalism might, might cause more harm than good. Rafe Champion, founder and CEO of Energy Agnostics, joins us this afternoon. Rafe, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for coming on. As always, you can post a question um, in the comments section for Rafe to answer, and we'll try to get to, we'll try to, get to as many of these questions as we can throughout the hour. Um, but firstly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to approach the issue of climate change? Well, I'm an, an agricultural scientist by training. Uh, and I did postgraduate work, uh, published research findings in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, that was back in the 1960s. Uh, I then went off into the social sciences and didn't take, and also with the philosophy of, a really powerful interest in the philosophy of science and particularly the philosophy of Karl Popper as a sort of passionate hobby on the side. and. Around about 2010, the climate science issue came to my attention. I just thought it was off to the fringe before that, but suddenly I thought, I'm a, I'm a trained scientist, I better find out what's going on here. <clears throat> I did delay because I thought it might take years to get on top of the subject and I was busy with other things. But I had a, a fortuitous meeting. Uh, with Christopher Monckton, and he just had a bit of a chat, and I could start to say it wasn't that hard. And then I also discovered that, that something has gone badly wrong in the mainstream discipline, seriously, seriously wrong. And so my philosophy of science background and my research experience suddenly became powerful weapons to come to grips with this strange phenomenon of climate alarmism. What do we know about the emissions target that Labor is pushing, and how do how did they convince the crossbench and the Greens to vote yes, despite the fact that they're willing to push further emissions? Well, because of the the manipulation of the debate, the truth, the real science, the solid, robust science of climate science, climate has just been buried by a major PR exercise, starting with the IPCC, which was set up for that purpose. It was set up to be a scientific body that could be used to justify anything that the politicians and activists wanted to say about the climate. They were, you know, they've been backed up in that respect by 30, something like 30 years of solid uh, indoctrination in the schools. Now that went, got by, it was off my radar because my children left school more 30 years ago or more. Uh, and there's only the tip of the iceberg apparently and in the form of charts, charts on the notice board in the classrooms about the green, about the, the ozone hole effect, which was obviously a trial run a trial run for the larger indoctrination into global warming. So what's happened for 30, with 30 years of indoctrination, uh, every year a fresh cohort of students emerges to be Greens, Green Labor voters or Green and Pink Liberal voters. And so anybody above the age 
below the age of about 30 has just been totally conned by the education system uh, to the point where they intimidate their parents <coughs> and their grandparents <laughs> uh, shamefully. Can you, can you talk to us more about the history of, of this deception? Because, of course, you know, you know that's what a lot, uh, certainly people my age, that's all we ever got at school. Yeah, well, I, I should have, I, I, because I've lately got into energy rather than climate, funnily enough, I'm oh, sorry, I better get to answer your question. Um, I, I'll, I'll get back to the question of how that happened. But I'll first of all say that about five years ago, I thought that a good, simple introduction to climate science would be a helpful addition to the debate. But I got about halfway through the book and two things happened. One was I, I needed a co-author to do the heavier science work because I, I could see that had to, the science had to be treated thoroughly, even if it had to be treated understandably. So I brought Jeff Grimshaw on board to do the heavy lifting in science and I got more and more into energy uh, and also I realized that the climate debate was gone the public there's no way of winning the climate debate in public so that's it, the, the battle has to be won on the energy front which is what we'll get back to when we start talking about the emissions control legislation so I got out of the climate and into energy <coughs> And getting back to your original question about how this all came about, you really have to look at the incredibly clever manoeuvres of a man called Morris Strong. Morris Strong was an amazing mover and shaker. He did time in the oil industry. He was very successful in private enterprise, but he was essentially a communist and he ended his days in communist China. But he, he got to be the spearhead of the environmental movement inside the united nations and he was like he was just head of all the appropriate committees to set up things like the ipcc and the stated agenda of all of these folk and it's no secret about it their agenda was to transform the economic system of the capitalist western world and they said it you know it's not a con it's not like made up it's like a conspiracy theory they just said it straight out it's not like a conspiracy, it was just a plan. And it's a plan that worked very well because of the immensely high regard people held for the United Nations. Nations failed to avert World War II, but now we have the United Nations. This is going to be much better. And it also had a much wider remit. I got, got into culture and agriculture. Uh, so. The game was won on the basis of the prestige of the United Nations and the parallel process of the corruption of climate science, which got taken over by big science after World War II became big and it became primarily funded by governments. And so where previous, prior to World War II, uh, science was quite small and it's funded by multitudinous sources. As it became a government venture, it became totally politicised, which is where it's been ever since I entered the climate science debate. So it's a triumph of politics over credible science. And in that, in that sense, science is now not only anti-essentialist, but those who are attempting an essentialist approach, um, both their views and they themselves are considered symbols, are the symbols of hate or symbols of some um, extreme fringe group by which you know uh, the pub the public are taught to to fear to fear outright. Yeah, a remarkable process of demonisations occurred, and also a remarkable process of scaring the wits out of school kids. Hmm. And not just school kids. I should maybe say to preface my introduction to myself, <laughs> uh, I, I give myself five ticks on five five aspects of commentary. 
first of all, I'm a properly trained scientist with a research track record published in the peer-reviewed literature. Mm. Secondly, I've had hands-on experience with multivariate models by chance. I got that in the Department of Health. So I know what goes on inside model building. I know how you can get the model to say what you want and how hard it can be to interpret if it's at all complicated. Mm. Uh, on top of that, I've spent a better, say, 10 years in the serious literature, of not just op-eds and magazine articles, but the solid, serious books and literature. Uh, and the final thing is I'm completely independent. I'm not employed by any kind of employer, so I don't have to care what my employer thinks. I felt a bit guarded when I was in still working in the Department of Health. I, I didn't have a position on this, but I still felt uncomfortable going out on a limb. And so I'm not neither in, I'm not employed and I'm not being paid to say stuff. Like I, I can claim complete independence. So that gives me a, a kind of a license to form my own opinion and not be dominated by or intimidated by the IPCC or the so-called consensus uh, at all. Uh, do you believe there'll be more legislation on the line that would be similar to the Green New Deal proposed by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in America? Well, they, they said, well, it, but they probably don't need, they've probably got enough legislation, everything else can be done by, by regulation and particularly <clears throat> by lawfare by green groups who can appeal to aspects of the legislation which is in place or regulation. So th they could do more, but they don't need to. They can do all the damage that, that they need to do without any more legislation. And But they just don't need more legislation to wreck the system. They've done enough already. Can you explain... Sorry, could, could you expand upon that? How, how are they going to wreck the system? I mean, I mean, I mean, the Americans, you know, Joe Biden's only been in power for about two, two or so years. So how, how, how can they already have wrecked the system? Well, they wrecked it by, by subsidising when subsidising so-called renewable energy, sub subsidising unreliable energy, like for many years, and mandating the use of that unreliable energy as well by way of the compulsory purchase of renewable energy certificates. So in other words, unreliable energy has corrupted the grid, put up the prices, uh, and it's done that because it's subsidised and mandated. Uh, in a sense, the emissions control legislation is just icing on the cake. It just gives them a license to do even more of the same thing. So so is it more that so the groundwork was already laid prior to Trump taking um, taking office? Um, that groundwork was not not removed as they became in, um, energy independent. And then when Joe Biden took over um, took over they said they ceased being you know they well they ceased being the number one uh, number well, one export of oil. Um, and you know, and, and just return to their just return to their original framework. Well, they probably didn't expect Trump to win, but as soon as he looked like, as soon as he actually won, they would have done have done everything they could to to Trump proof, Trump proof the destructive regulations that were put in place previously. Mm. Uh, I mean, the Supreme Court did a wonderful thing just recently when they decided that uh, that it wasn't legitimate to be so tough on CO2 from power stations, but it took forever for that to happen. That's what took, that couldn't happen until there was enough good, sensible, lovely people on the Supreme Court to do it. Hmm. Uh, so that was Trump's legacy, I guess, was to put people there who could do what needed to be done. Uh, but even so... We know that they can still keep wrecking the system by putting more money, just simply putting more money into unreliable energy, which is only going to, and this is my case against the 
our legislation, and I, I sent a briefing note to every rep in the House of Reps saying that this, you're about to pass legislation which can only have the effect of increasing the price of power and reducing the reliability mm. with commitment damage to the environment. So it's a triple whammy. Uh, and that those propositions can be explained with the most simple publicly available data that the energy realists, which is my crowd, are trying to get outside of our bubble mm. to a broader audience so that it becomes common knowledge that we have wind droughts. Uh, we, we do not have grid scale storage and we have to have continuity of supply. We cannot have breaks in supply. So with those three things together, all we're going to get out of, given, given those things, we cannot afford to lose any more coal power at all. Like we've lost all of our spare capacity is gone over the last 10 years. When we've now reached a critical tipping point where if another power station or two goes, Every time there's low wind overnight, like when there's next to no renew renewable energy overnight, that will be a full-scale crisis for the uh, southeastern Australia. And that, and you're predicting that between now and 2030, this passes. Um, oh, long before 2030. Right. Maybe. Well, at, at the first manifestation, I thought. I thought not knowing that much, not knowing nearly enough about the system. I thought that the first manifestation would be blackouts, but in fact it's turned out to be a price. Because of the back the background to all this loss of coal has put up the price, the wholesale price of gas has possibly quadrupled over twelve months. And has yet to that wholesale effect has yet to flow into retail. Well that started last month. As the bills will suddenly start to expand go up seriously mm. and you have to raise the question of how how much longer have our power intensive industries actually got to survive in a situation where the price of a major input appears to have gone up fourfold you know it may stabilize but it's going to stabilize way above the level that it was a year ago right i i, I don't know if we're particularly ready um for that and, and if you're saying it's going to it's going to you know this will continue until 2030 and then furthermore there'll be there'll be future targets beyond 2030 up to 20 up to 2050 so you're expecting prices to go up even higher than, um, than what you're expecting well there's a you have to hope that sanity will intrude <laughs> before we go any further down that track you have to hope uh you have to, Something that's happening out, out of sight right now is deliberations by the Energy Security Board. Energy, Energy Security Board uh, is a professional regulatory body charged by the combined governments of Australia to come up with a mechanism that they call capacity payments to pay power providers a, to have available capacity. But they want to have available capacity that can be turned on to keep the lights on. And the question is, well, this, these payments are going to have to be made to coal and gas generators. But, of course, the Greens and the new Victorian government don't want <laughs> fossil fuels to be allowed to have capacity payments. But the unreliables can't deliver reliable capacity by definition. So the Energy Security Board is under massive kind of left-wing political pressure to not do anything to help fossil fuels, and it's under massive pressure of common sense and the desire to keep the lights on, which means inevitably finding some way to subsidise uh, the coal produce, the coal generators and or they have, they're going to have to be subsidised to keep going, mm. which is plain crazy. Okay, you subsidise the renewables 
to put coal out of business and to keep the lights on, you're going to have to subsidise coal so they don't go out of business. So it's just going to be really interesting to see how this plays out in the public debate, you know, past the popcorn. Uh, we understand that uh, Australians tend to have a scepticism towards nuclear power, uh, particularly because of anti-nuclear movements, uh, which Anthony Albanese has been a part of. Uh, why do Australians, particularly Labor and the Greens, uh, distrust nuclear? Well, I've got the answer to that. Uh, a man called John Grover wrote a book published in 1983 and it's called Struggle for Power. And it's a blow-by-blow -blow account of the worldwide campaign against nuclear power, which emerged out of the ban the bomb movement that was filling up the streets of London with protesters in the 1950s. So there was a worldwide movement. Of, and then to ban the bomb was like the the Trojan horse, everybody could see the point of stopping nuclear tests inside the atmosphere. Okay, that's good. Uh, but it got popular support from everybody who thought you know, nuclear testing was dangerous. And this enabled the communist movement of the world to establish themselves with another front, like typically the communists infiltrated everything they could find, every peace movement had communists in it. Their primary mission was to capture the education system. So your teachers' federations around, teachers' unions around the world are all left, more or less radically left wing. And in, in Australia, the pro, their, their program succeeded 100%, partly because in New South Wales, in a couple of years during the 1970s, the teachers were holding, handing out blatant propaganda in the classrooms. Like the New South Wales public education system became a full on, full on propaganda apparatus for the international communist movement. And so there you go. Uh, it's all spelled out in John Graver's book. And I've done a summary of the relevant chapter and put on my website. So anybody who ever wants to know why we are where we are uh, can find out off my website. And I keep telling people over and over again, but I don't, obviously I don't get to talk, not enough people read my stuff. So it's still apparently not, not common knowledge how this happened. So, so is that, would there be further literature beyond John Grover's book, beyond your summaries? In, regard, in regards to this infiltration? So I don't, as you said, it's not widely known. Yeah, well, it, see, this kind of communist involvement has just surfaced lately in Britain where they reckon, you know, the Russia's funding anti-fracking protests. Well, my point would be, why would you, they never needed to fund it for the last 20 years, the, the, the radical Green movement seems to have all, all the momentum it needs on its own with, with, without funding from some foreign source. But, I mean, certainly to be an obvious part of the, the Russian game plan to, or the communist game plan was always to fund anything that would do damage in the West. Uh, it's just surprising that they, they needed to do it so recently because that radical green movement has been so strong for years now but now that i haven't tracked the literature as far as i i mean think people like the guy who defected from greenpeace has sure certain surely said something about it like the fact one of the founders of greenpeace mm. bailed out and condemned it as a just a radical disruptive movement uh, so, but even so, the, the propaganda, the mainstream media have persisted with a very unhelpful narrative. And it's only got worse since the Australians started going really green and pink a few this year. Do you think the problem then might be, um, 
do you think the problem might, might be our, our language in that we don't actually, we, we can't argue outside of the language that sort of we've inherited that we, that we commonly use in a sense, in a sense, the language has been captured. And so it's well, hard to walk outside of it. Well, I guess the first big move in the language game was to shift from being worried about, shift from talking about global warming to climate change because because of the so-called so pause in warming that seemed to occur after about 1998, like the, the line's wavy and there's a big blip at 98. And so you take that as a high point, it didn't go very far for 10 or 15 years. But of course, during that time, the, there's been increasing manipulation of the basic data, like agencies like the Bureau of Meteorology have clearly falsified the records uh, so, but the point, okay, they stopped talk, they shifted to, to climate change and then they started getting concerned about extreme weather events. Now, the, the hard data that even comes out of the IPC literature, some of which is good, that the hard data show that there's been no increase in extreme events of fires, floods, storms, hurricanes, you name it. It's all either flat or in, declined at marginally. So, but that just doesn't get into the mainstream narrative. And one reason for that is that there was an international movement, uh, I forget the name, but it was basically a con confederation of media agencies dedicated to promoting climate alarm through every type of media. And so you get all these newspaper chains, Reuters and people like that, they all signed up and a few years ago, they even got to the point of reef putting out new language, but they weren't going to talk about global warming anymore. They're going to talk about global heating. Uh, and, you, and instead of just talking about uh, warming problems, there's going to be a climate crisis. Uh, and then, then there's something like existential threat to species. So I think yeah, you're quite right. They've, they've ramped up the language, uh, even to the point of having lexicons, you know, like, no, we don't talk about global warming anymore, now it's global heating. Yeah? Uh, and anything to do with weather has got to be extreme, it's got to mention extreme. And any fire or flood, it's got to be seen as an expression of this uh, existential threat of climate change. And this is all being superimposed upon a top of 30 years of solid propaganda in the schools and, and parents who, who are just intimidated by their so-called well-educated youngsters, you know, you know, the most educated youth of all time, uh, ha, ha. Uh, you know, it's real really tough for the grandparents to hold the line these days. Hmm. So if, if you go a little bit further into um, just expanding upon the Bureau of Meteorology falsifying data, so could you, could you explain that? Could you substantiate it? Well, I can't, I'm not the... Uh, since since I'm, I've been out of climate for some time into energy, mm. you really have to go to someone like Jennifer Marahasi uh, at the IPA. She's she's the one who's done this, the heavy lifting mm. on that, and it, it it's terribly laborious. You have to go back through paper records in like newspapers and and public libraries to see what temperatures were being recorded in different country towns and then to see how they've been changed in the current data that's put out by the BOM. It's, I, I can only elaborate by saying you need to go to Jennifer Marahasi hmm. to get the full story. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's sort of not my area. It's not an area where I, where I can speak with personal experience of handling the data and doing the hard work to, to get into it. No, no worries. We'll we'll post in the comment section. I've actually got the link um, to her profile for the IPA. Good. I, I should say, if you really want to get to my kind of areas of strength and major concern, that's in the energy field. That's back to where what what's happening. What Lachlan was referring to is well, what happens with emission control? What what's going to come out of that? That that's kind of my area more than the time of science. Although I should say the book which I started to write, has, which is taken over by Jeff Grimshaw, 
it's this very last weekend he's actually put the book up on the Amazon site so it can actually be purchased so it? it's out <laughs> what's the name of it it's called trigger trigger warming uh, and I've got myself in as a co-author simply because I started the project and also I want to get half of the money because I put money in to pr help and produce it and I want to get a little bit of something back uh, and also it'll split his income if, if it will not, not going to be much in it don't, don't worry it's not going to be his best seller but uh, you can get to it by going on the Amazon site and searching in books for either Jeff Grimshaw or Rafe Champion so you can find it through both of those searches will then take you to the book yeah, we'll put it in the comment section thank you Rafe you've already alluded to a link uh with communist ideology we know that green activists like Adam Bant have had links to Trotskyism and communism so could you expand a bit on what you think brings socialists into getting involved with uh, green activism well well the greens are simply linear descendants of the old communist party i mean some of them are like descendants of major figures in the communist party uh, communism of course kind of went out of fashion to some extent but but it never went away uh it it, it it did its work by getting into the education system and it got and particularly the universities by way of cultural marxism so you given that that given the anti-western anti-capitalist bias which permeates or particularly the the general curriculum provided for school that's been put out since since the uh, Rudd Gillard government. I mean, that, that's the most destruct. That's just absolute mine shell or bomb a mine planted under Western civilization. That that gen that curriculum. Uh, so it's just tailored to produce people who will vote green. Right. Well, I, I remember back then, like two thousand seven. Um, you know, there were large campaigns in regards to um, the climate change, global warming. Um, like, like I, I, you know, you know, every 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 child was talking about it. Um, if I if I can bring up um, the uh, the Dutch farmers in the Netherlands, they're revolting against their own government um, over their plans to reduce nitrogen emissions, which would involve cutting down on livestock because they're the biggest source. Um, why do they not receive much attention, um, especially compared to you know the sort of school kid protests that you see here? Um, and f and furthermore. Do you believe that they will happen here? Well, the, the question of coverage and attention comes back to the editorial, official editorial policy of the different news media and also the predilections and beliefs of the working journalists and commentators which have been drifting left all my life uh, most obviously in the case of the abc which least 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 acceptable since they're supposed to be represent the whole of the public but the put basically the media can say what they like and they can stop other voices from being heard and they're doing that to great excess success um, which is why we're setting up what I call the National Information Network to get energy information down to the grassroots of the community, circumventing the mainstream media that won't tell them what they need to know. But it's going to be a tough, well, I'm getting back to the community protest. Well, um, Yeah, I mean, I, the, the things that are being done, like in Holland, and in, well, it's been done in Sri Lanka as well, with which at least put the government to flight. At least, uh, maybe the Dutch farmers will put their government to flight. But of course, 
uh, most of the people in Holland live in the cities, not on the farms. Mm. So even though they're we're very visible when they get out on the road with their tractors, they're still a minority group. Let, let's face it, there are, there are so many crises. There's a, there's a worldwide food crisis in plain view due to the shortage of nitrogenous fertilisers due to the price of gas. Like one of the first effects of increased prices of gas in Europe was dramatic curtailment of the production of nitrogenous fertilisers. Uh, and given that the world's population is only being fed by the immense productivity that we get from improved species of plants and, in, and, and large amounts of artificial fertiliser applied, you, you stop applying the fertiliser, you, you cut your yield, you're, look, you're looking at famine, widespread famine in countries that are food importers. We're, okay, we're a food exporter, so we're not going to starve here, but most of the countries of the world, believe it or not, are food importers. Hmm. When, when do you believe that will happen? Well, it's, it's happening now. <laughs> uh, it's happening now. Uh, I, I think there are some food shortages of certain items, but in terms of going into a famine, um, you know, and, and furthermore, which countries do you believe? Well, believe next year, like proper famine. Well, of course, we're currently like in the northern hemisphere. I suppose it's now the harvest season, so everything depends on this harvest to see them through their next winter, because there won't be any fresh harvest until like twelve months. Uh, and we know that there's a dramatic reduction of grain coming out of Ukraine, which is one of the world's great food baskets. Like they just produce massive amounts of every type of food, and that's all going to be reduced. That's, that, that's just the impact of the war. That's before you count the impact of the reduced yields from plantings with, with, with inadequate fertilisation. Uh, Again, it's a topic that calls for more research and more commentary. And I can only speak in broad brush terms because my main focus has been like the, the energy system of Australia and what's going on with the wind droughts and that type of thing. And I just keep an eye on these other things out of the corner of my eye. Mm. Uh, and I'm not quite sure... Uh, well, you just, can't, you just can't get the, the commentary that you need out of the mainstream media. It's just not there. Uh, you've got to go to international sources of, of non-mainstream non sources like oh, The Spectator, uh, Epoch News, There's many, many uh, Net Zero Watch from the Global Warming Policy Forum. There's, there are many sources, but they're none of them mainstream. You've got to go out of your way to find them. Historically, so there've been many. There've been a number of green bans across New South Wales. What have been the effects of green bans in terms of building uh, infrastructure? Um, well, I, I think you're you're, had, you're referring here to like the uh, the Jack Mundy type green bans of long ago. So that that was mostly urban development. They didn't. They wanted. To, they had notional support from con 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 conservation groups to save supposedly valuable architectural heritage, which sometimes was true and sometimes wasn't. Uh, I guess the major problem with infrastructure has been dams, and that hasn't been a decent dam built in Australia in practically living memory. And given that water management is one of our absolute major priorities to not have new dams is it's like a national suicide policy um it's just amazing that they've got away with it because i, I guess so few people in the cities yeah, because so, so many like in my lifetime there's been a mass movement of people off off farms because mechanization is just de uh, decimated the rural workforce so uh, like on the farm where I grew up, at one stage it was supporting three families, 
by the time I left Tasmania, it was just supporting my brother and his family. So it was one family as opposed to three. So in other words, there's nothing, there's just not enough people in the population who have any understanding of what's going on in the country. Unless you actually watch Landline on, on the ABC of all places, um, that might be one of the surviving areas of excellence in the ABC. But why do you think that the left keeps uh, claiming that a wind and solar is the way to go, even when there are such significant flaws uh, as as a means of power supply? So why do they keep saying this, even though it's not true? Yes. Why do they keep? Yeah. Why do they keep claiming that wind and solar are working? Oh, I know how the, I know how it goes. Yeah. What 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 they say is. Uh, look how much of our power is now coming from wind and solar so uh it's now over a 12 month period you might find it approaching 30 percent and 20 years ago it might have been five percent and so they say okay look we've we got we've got we're on the up it's taking over it's drive it it's it's just it's just going up in, in, inexorably uh, but the problem with counting the and, that, and the more windmills you build and the more solar panels, obviously the more unreliable energy you generate. But this is where you have to understand a very critical point, which I labour in different ways. The first point I labour is the existence of wind droughts. That is to say, periods, prolonged periods with next to no wind. Like in, there's been a wind drought in the state of Victoria for the last 24 hours. Uh, their windmills have been producing less than 10% of their theoretical capacity. Uh, you, you have to understand that there are these periods which can extend across the whole of southeastern Australia when there's a high pressure system hovering there sometimes for four or five days. Uh, so no, this didn't matter when we had enough coal power to keep the lights on without any need of unreliable energy. Uh, but, but when you get to the point where you actually don't have enough coal and power to keep things going by itself, you need some help from the wind. And if the wind's not there, parts of the system fail. And what you have to understand is you have to think about, and this is where we've helped to be a farmer, you have to think about a fence around a paddock with cattle in it uh, if there's a gap in the fence, uh, the cattle get out. And it doesn't matter how high the fence is elsewhere, you can build it to the sky. If there's a gap, the cattle get out. Similarly, with a flood levy, uh, you can have a big, tall levy in places, but if there's gaps in the levy, okay, the water gets in. Um, you might have a big petrol tank in your car, but if there's no petrol in it, the size of the tank doesn't help. So all of these things point to the direction that, that the critical number you have to look at to, to, for, to judge the sustainability of a system based on unreliable energy, you've got to look at the worst case scenario, the lowest point of the fence, if you like, on windless nights, when for practical purposes it's zero. And when, when there's no wind or sun about, it doesn't matter, you can have 10 times as much installed capacity and you still don't get anything out of it so that's so they can claim in fact they this week on wednesday thursday there was a record amounts of wind best days on record okay that's because they got more and more plant installed now than they've had before okay not so you get a good steady wind blowing for 24 hours 48 hours yeah it's no surprise you get record amounts of wind power but as of like yesterday, it's all came tumbling down. Uh, and midway of the day, we, we were well into a, a continent-wide wind drought, uh, although at that stage there's lots of sun. So so you could see that renewable energy combined was still quite impressive because of the amount of sun. But come sunset, like now, uh, and this is, where, this is where I want everybody in Australia to, to be watching... Uh, the NEMWATCH widget. There's a widget put out by a agency, and it, 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 it's a display. Was there's a bar? There's bars for each state to, to show 
how much power has been generated in that state and that the bars are color coded like there's black for coal power brown black for black coal brown for brown coal red for gas blue for hydro green for wind and shades of gold for field and rooftop solar so i want everybody to be looking at this widget it changes every five minutes to keep up with what's happening and i want people to look at this at the breakfast and dinner time because at breakfast there's no solar and at dinner time the solar is rapidly fading and also breakfast and dinner time are sort of peaks of demand the demand drops away after breakfast and it drops away after dinner people need to see how often you look at those bars and there's next to no green next to no green in other words a wind drought and you have to know as you sit there eating your hot breakfast or dinner that when you see these bars have got very little green well you know that you wouldn't be having a hot breakfast and you wouldn't have the lights on if it if if it depended on the green very a very vivid visual display to show the failure of with the renewable energy movement I, I haven't actually heard of this I've, I've just looked this up and we put it in the comment section i can look at new south wales right now um and oh, the bar the bar is majority the bar is majority black it must be 75 percent black for some reason it's not showing yeah. how much um but there's there's like a few hundred me uh, megawatts for, for for the green bar so wind power and i think it was Hold on, it's over seven thousand megawatts for black coal. So just well, that's it. Black black coal is the staple provider in New South Wales, Queensland, and in Victoria. It's brown coal. Yeah, no, they, they don't have black coal. There. It's all brown. Yeah, you look at this. I can barely see the green in WA. There's no green in Tasmania. In Tasmania, in South Australia, which is the wind-leading state, uh, mm. there's a tiny little bit of green in between the red and the gold. Victoria, it, you can't see the green. They've been in, it's there, but it's so thin you can't see it. They've been in wind drought for more than 24 hours an hour. New South Wales, right deep in wind drought. Okay, this, this is an absolute classic wind drought situation. This is probably one of the best that I've seen or, or worst. Mm. Yeah, this is one for your scrapbook uh, it's absolutely spot on time so you get you want people to see this you want this they people they need see when you look at that display you have to say to people well hang on uh how many windmills do we need to get those little green bits to expand to occupy the space which is currently occupied by the black in well, new south wales can you imagine the number of windmills well, even 10 times the amount won't match it. No, it wouldn't even start. It, 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 and the, the, the amusing thing is this widget is put out by a group called Renew Economy, and they're absolutely fanatics about renewable energy. And they don't seem to have realised that they've put up the most powerful weapon that we to, de to demonstrate the failure. And they only keep it afloat by, by telling... The good news when there's lot when when it's a lot of when it's like a record and and people just have to understand the need to it's not good enough having record days you've got you got to it's got to be there every day 24 hours of every day mm. and right now we'd be so deep in the dark we certainly wouldn't be having this show on wow you seeing you really put that into perspective again we put that in the comment section now um, we've only got a few more minutes left um if i can ask Roger Scruton once said that environmentalism evokes a sense of patriotism and an appreciation of beauty in nature. And environmentalists have a romantic notion of preserving original beauty. Um, I myself am an artist um, as well, and you take on the Greek definition that art mimics nature. Um, what's a healthy alternative to current modern green activism? What would an actual right-wing environmental agenda look like? Well, it probably look like the the conserv what we used to call the conservation movement before it got taken over by radical greens and reds and that, that and that was what was so damaging about the anti-nuclear that that campaign was was got them into the environmental movement they, they turned up agitating against the bomb 
and then they suddenly found that they could use this to penetrate the environmental conservation movement. The conservation movement before that was quite sensible, just doing all the normal things you do if you care about the environment. Uh, but the radical green agenda transformed it into a to, to a point where most of the things that they're doing, like the renewable energy movement, is probably the most anti-environmental force around. I mean, the, the damage being done all around the world from, from the starting point with mining these minerals, processing them in toxic swamps in third world countries, uh, tearing up roads through our forests, uh, killing birds and bats and just generally, just a carnage. And then, of course, that, when they're all worn out, they'll be thrown into a landfill and these and toxic chemicals will leak into the groundwater. So the, the environmental toll is in just incalculable uh, and it's just not being told because the official environmental groups have all been taken over by Greens. Again, it's the march, the march of the Reds through the institutions. Hmm. Do you believe that hydrogen energy is a good source of power? Well, the well, short answer is just, it's just a silly joke. Uh, hydrogen, okay, hydrogen generated by conventional means has, well, has essential industrial uses. Powering vehicles in lieu of gas is just hugely problematic. But then when you get, want to do it green, it becomes immensely more problematic because you have to put so much energy in it to start to make it green that the round trip, it's just the most inefficient way of delivering power you could ever think of. And, and even old Twiggy said the other day, well, actually, we haven't even produced a bucket full of it yet. Well, you know, take take that seriously when he does start to produce a few bucketfuls. It's a total hype. No, total hype. I mean, it's just beyond belief that it's getting subsidised. Well, well, Rafe Champion, founder and CEO of Energy Agnostics, thank you so much for joining us on Sunday Sessions. Well, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for the opportunity.